Welcome to video 9 in the series uh, control design for this rotary pendulum. Uh, today we will look at the linear MPC, uh, so linear model predictive control. And the task is very similar to that of the last video. We're going to move the arm here uh, to follow a uh, reference trajectory. And the pendulum would be kind of a disturbance that uh, prevents that from being easy. Uh, this time, since we're using MPC, we will actually use a model of the uh, process. So we use, uh, since we use linear MPC, uh, we will linearize the system around this downward equi equilibrium and uh, use that model for, uh, for the MPC controller. So we will dive into uh, VS Code here, where I have loaded a bunch of packages. And for the linear MPC controller, we need to define an operating point. And in that case, in this case, this is just uh, uh, the origin. So we define an operating point for the state, for the control, and for the uh, output. And the sample time we will use here is five milliseconds. So MPC is somewhat computationally expensive. Um, five milliseconds is what we used uh, for the sliding mode controller. Uh, but since uh, linear MPC solves a quadratic program, we can still uh, solve that fairly quickly and, and five milliseconds is, is no problem. Uh, so we'll start by defining these things. Uh, then we will linearize the system. Uh, we have an instance of the simulator here. So this uh, cube servo is what we, cube servo pendulum is what we use to actually control the physical device. And the simulator version is just um, yeah, what it sounds like. It's a simulator that has uh, dynamic equations. And we load the optimized parameters we found in a previous um, video. So I have a little helper here that linearizes the dynamics and the measurement function and gives me a state space system back. And it looks like this, and that's in continuous time. The controller is a discrete time controller. So we will discretize that using zero order hold and the uh, chosen sample time. So when we do that, we get the corresponding discrete time system back. Uh, then, since we have some friction and some disturbance here in the cable, uh, we need to endow our uh, uh, MPC controller with the integrating action. And one way to do that is to augment the system model with a disturbance state. So we say that there is a low frequency disturbance acting on the input here. And that corresponds to some kind of disturbance torque that acts similar to the torque we control with. And I have a little helper function to, uh, to uh, add such an input disturbance. So here I say that I want to add a low frequency disturbance to my discrete time system, and it enters through the same uh, uh, control entry matrix as, as the input does. And this epsilon here says that instead of an integrator, we actually make it epsilon uh, stable uh, so that we can solve the, the um, we cut the equation efficiently later. So we now have a discrete time system model here. Instead of four states, we have five states. Uh, we have uh, an integrating uh, pole here, almost. Remember, we moved it slightly into the stable region. Uh, otherwise, uh, it looks the same as before. I then define uh, operating points that are one element longer. So. Uh, to account for the fact that we now have one additional state variable. So uh, the suffix E here is for extended. So I now have an extended operating point. Then we can define some constraints. So we say that the MPC controller is not allowed to use more than plus minus 10 in the control input. And we can also say that we want to constrain the state. So the second element of the state vector is the pendulum angle. It's this angle here. So I will define a constraint saying that that is not allowed to be more than 0.1 radians. So um, that is 5.7 degrees. So that's actually a very small angle. So first we will solve the MPC problem without any state constraints. And then I will activate this code here and solve it with the state constraints and we will look at the difference. So for now, we define the constraints without the uh, constraint on the angle. Then we choose a solver and we use the OSQP solver for linear MPC. And here I specify some options. I say that I don't want it to print anything while it's solving. I give it a, a tolerance. Say that it's maximum allowed to take this many iterations. And then I give it a time limit here. And our sample time is five milliseconds. 
as I say, it's allowed to use 95% of that. So that makes sure that the solver returns uh, before our deadline is over. Uh, check, the ter check termination, it checks every fifth iteration, it checks if it's done, have met the uh, criteria. And I don't want it to do solution polishing. It's something uh, specific to OSQP that tries to find a very accurate solution in the end, but we don't need it now. Uh, then I specify the quadratic cost function for the uh, MPC problem. Here I specify uh, four values. So this is for the four control variables corresponding to the state variables of the physical system. I don't provide any value for the disturbance state I added up here. And that's because I tell the controller later that I'm only interested in, in controlling the first four variables. Uh, so this is now a diagonal matrix of size 4 and then I have the control input penalty here and uh, then I provide a covariance matrices for the comma filter we use a standard comma filter here since it's a linear MPC problem we can actually use nonlinear observers uh, even though we use a linear MPC problem but we're not going to do that here so these uh, co uh, comma filter covariance matrices are the same as we derived in the previous video then I specify a uh, optimization horizon for the MPC controller. Here I chose 50. 50 is uh, fairly long, but it's uh, no problem because the MPC uh, toolbox is, is quick, so we can handle uh, 50 time steps. Then I have my reference function. It's the same as uh, for the previous position control video. Uh, I uh, tell the MPC controller that my controlled variables, those I'm interested in actually uh, penalizing, are variables 1 to 4. So uh, the default is all of the variables, so that would include the disturbance state. But the disturbance state is obviously not controllable, uh, so there is no point in actually providing any penalty for that state. I could also have specified Z as a matrix so in this case, the matrix would look like this. Uh, we have four control outputs, but we have five states and we don't have any output for the fifth state. But it's okay to provide a vector of indices as well. So I package this into a linear MPC problem. I give it the operating point, the initial state and my control variables, the observer and the system model. Then I put that into an LQ MPC problem. So that stands for linear quadratic MPC problem. And I provide also the, the cost matrices for the, the LQR problem, the optimization horizon and so on. And R here is my, my reference. So R start, uh, starts out being a trajectory uh, and it has the same length as the optimization horizon plus one uh, because there is a final, a final state as well. Uh, and this will be updated as we go along since it's a moving um, a trajectory. All right, we define a function that normalizes the angles to be between plus minus pi. And then we have our run control function. Uh, it starts out uh, the same as the previous uh, experiment functions by creating a data vector for logging and so on. And turns off the garbage collector. And then we will actually have a closer look at what's going on inside here. It collects a measurement. It computes a finite difference approximation to the velocity. And then uh, we call our reference function uh, for a certain vector into the future. Uh, so this computes the reference for the entire optimization horizon. And it does that each iteration. Uh, it's because the, the MPC controller can actually use foresight. It can use knowledge about future references um, to optimize the performance. And we make use of that here. Uh, then we take all our uh, signals, the previous control signal, the current measurement, and the reference trajectory, and pass that into an observer input structure. And that's our main input to the MPC controller. Then we ask the MPC controller to take a step, and internally this updates the observer and it performs the optimization pro uh, solves the optimization problem, and it returns to us the, the optimal solution. I also say that I don't want it to be verbose here, so it doesn't print anything in the terminal. Then uh, that returns a structure called a controller output, and that contains the optimal solution. 
Uh, and of course, I'm interested in the first value of the control signal in the optimal solution. If I had uh, uh, wanted to solve uh, just an open loop optimal control problem without any feedback, I might be interested in the entire solution here. But we use this in a feedback setting where we call this uh, repeatedly. So then we're only interested in the first uh, control input. Then I pass that to the physical process, so the actual hardware device, and then I do some logging. All right, uh, so we will see here. Here I have my uh, process object. I have now uh, recreated that, so I need to home it, reset the uh, sensor, and I look at what angle it says right now. It's about 30 degrees. So I say home it at 30 degrees. And then we run the MPC problem. All right, so it goes to the initial position and then it follows the reference directory. So let it do its thing here. And then we get a plot. And this plot is to be compared to uh, the plots from the previous video. We see the arm. This is the thing we want to follow a reference for. It did a step here in the beginning had some overshoot and then it did another step in another direction uh, had an overshoot and then it tries to follow this uh, sinusoidal reference here for a while an interesting aspect here is that when it goes from the high value to the low value we see that it actually starts performing the step before the actual reference step appears and that's because the uh, mpc controller has foresight so it knows that the reference will change in the future so it can actually start uh, taking the step a bit earlier. And this is what then minimizes the, the quadratic error over the prediction horizon. So if you, if you do not provide the reference uh, trajectory into the future, it, it would have been causal here. So it wouldn't make a step in the output until it sees the step in the reference. All right, and we see that the angle of the pendulum here uh, swings a lot. I've indicated the constraint we're going to solve for uh, uh, next here. But uh, right now we are not actually enforcing this constraint. So we see that we have very large uh, oscillations in the, in the pendulum while we perform this step. In the bottom left we have the control input and in the bottom right we have the timing. So that the green line here is the uh, timing I, uh, I set, our desired sample time. The blue line that is just ever so slightly above that is the actual timing. And the orange line here is the time it takes to solve the MPC problem. So we see that most of the time uh, the MPC problem is solved very, very quickly. Uh, but we see that every now and then it actually takes slightly longer. Uh, but crucially, it never takes too long. It, we never miss a deadline here, which is what we are ultimately interested in. All right. So let's now uh, activate the constraints and see if we can solve the problem again. So before we used this structure without any state constraints. Now we use with state constraints and then we solve the, the problem again. All right, it goes home and then it starts its trajectory here. And I don't know if it's visible, but it should be slightly more conservative now and not have so large pendulum deviations. And here we see the result. Uh, so we see, we can start looking at the pendulum angle here. So we see that now we have some slight violation of the constraint here in the beginning. Uh, and that's okay uh, because uh, we are using a linearized model of the process. So we know for sure that it's slightly inaccurate. And also even though, even, uh, even if we had used the, the non-linear model, uh, that is also slightly inaccurate, right? So we do expect some uh, slight deviations, but we're making use of soft state constraints here. So it's okay for the optimizer to violate them ever so slightly. But we see that it does a, a fairly good job at actually respecting it, uh, the constraints during the trajectory. We can compare to the previous one where we see it had much larger deviations here. So I can flip a bit uh, back and forth between those two. And if we compare uh, the plot here of the arm movement, uh, we see that uh, we have slightly smoother movements now when we don't allow so large pendulum deviations, but otherwise it looks roughly similar. If we look at the timing plot here, we see that uh, still uh, most of the time it's fairly quick to solve the problem. 
we see that there are a few more of these spikes where it takes a bit longer time. And that's in particular when we are uh, violating the constraints and the solver has to uh, uh, take care of the slack variables that take slightly longer than not having the, the slack variables. Uh, but we always do respect the, uh, the deadline here. So we never miss any deadline and that's the important thing. And since we have actually provided a time limit to the solver, it would always return uh, before the deadline is missed. And then it will return a slightly suboptimal solution. Uh, but most of the time, uh, unless it's extremely suboptimal, that's not a, a big problem. All right, so now we have seen how we can implement linear MPC with, with constraints uh, uh, for this pendulum problem. In a future video, we will show uh, perhaps nonlinear MPC as well. All right, thank you.